Tamino. Tamino. Let's go. Dear ladies, dear gentlemen, I thought that uh, all of you are going to be tired, so there is not going to be anybody at the night over session, so I was, I was wrong, which is, uh, which is good, because it means that uh, the next session is going to be interesting and it's going to be something that, uh, despite being tired, we are going to hear. Uh, so without further ado, let me first introduce Guillaume Closat. Guillaume Closat is a... Guillaume Closat is a French thinker, writer. He is also a consultant in uh, European public affairs, but most of all, he's a true European. He's a true European, and he's somebody who is thinking profoundly about the future of Europe and how we should preserve our continent for uh, the next generations to come. And uh, let me introduce also the second panelist, uh, which I'm just going to say, Mr. Slavoj Žižek. I don't think I have to say anything else. <laughs> The whole, the whole experience is going to go like this. First, Slavo is going to have a little presentation, a little speech about... For oh, 40 minutes. For 40 minutes. <laughs> L little. This is, this is the shortest that we could uh, get him speak. And then he is going to have a conversation together with uh, Guillaume Crossat on the important things. So, Slavo, the you. floor is yours. I begin. You ready? How are you ready? As they say in German, when the Nazis attack, ich bin immer einsatzbereit. <laughs> you know, if you know, you know. Okay, he so let's go. Speak. He it's time to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Savoy. Yeah. I hope you got my introductory joke. When you applaud that, I applaud that. No, you know what's the joke. Did you notice this beautiful difference between Nazism and Stalinism? In Nazism, when Hitler speaks, the public applauds and the leader just accepts the applause. In Stalinism, the leader stands up and joins the applause. So I have chosen <laughs> my side, sorry. <laughs> okay, now I really don't want to be too long. I'm sorry if some of you know the stuff I will be talking around. It will be very elementary, uh, using the old stuff. I want, I think it's in, I'm very close to your, you gave it to me yesterday, wonderful small book, uh, Fierté Européenne, European Pride, and yes, I agree with this. As a leftist, I'm getting tired of the old mantra of opposing Eurocentrism. What bothers many across the entire political spectrum from very secret police to liquidate the <laughs> traitors who are disturbing. <laughs> uh, Russian interference. Sorry? Russian interferences. There are no interferences or what? There is only enemy action, but okay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, let's go on quickly. What bothers many across the entire political spectrum, hey, stop, please, huh? from the anti-colonialist left to the populist right, is the idea of a united Europe. With all the justified critique of some key parts of European legacy, I think that what makes Europe such an object of hatred and envy is the idea that in the eyes of many, Europe still stands for peaceful cooperation of nations, personal freedom, welfare state, and so on and so on. Europe is, as far as I know, the only example of what 
at least in an elementary form, of what is better this. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I can do it like this. Uh, of what we need today more than ever. Not more sovereignty, not also one big central gover government, world government, that would have meant probably unimaginable corruption and so on, but a much closer cooperation, obligatory even cooperation. Just think about what is awaiting us. Another, let's say, uh, another pandemic or hunger or war or whatever, global warming. Are you aware that millions will probably become immigrants, they will have to move and the choice will be only war or cooperation. Uh, and to destroy this, not just part of Ukraine, I think is Putin's real goal. Uh, on the afternoon of March the 1st, 2022, video speaking to the European Parliament, Zelensky said, Ukraine is ready to die for Europe. Now let's see if Europe is ready to die for Ukraine. I agree, but which Europe? We should ask ourselves what the Ukrainians see in Europe. And are we ready to live up to the, their expectations? Whichever way you turn it, United Europe stands for some kind of social democracy. Not social democracy in the narrow sense of a social democratic party in power. Peter Sloterdijk, my friend, a conservative German philosopher, distinguishes between what he calls subjective social democracy, parties, movements, and what he calls objective social democracy. Social democratic measures, like again, uh, free education, healthcare, and so on, uh, which are embedded in state apparatuses and public life independently of who is in power. I remember, I'm old enough, many of you are not, when for the first time after decades in Sweden, Palme and Social Democrats lost power. And we were all afraid, what will happen? Nothing happened. That's why I like, because the legacy of Swedish was so deeply ingrained in social texture that it didn't matter who is in power. No wonder Viktor Orban, in a recent interview, proclaimed that the Western liberal hegemony is gradually becoming Marxist. They are essentially Marxist with liberal remnants, Orban said. In short, Europe is in the middle of a big ideological conflict about its identity. And Ukraine will confront the true choice if, or hopefully when, it will win. Will it join the camp of illiber illiberal conservatives or will it become part of the United Social Democratic Europe? This legacy of Europe is universal. If we just defend Europe, we already speak the language of Alexander Dugin, who, as you know, uh, opposes Russian truth to European truth. No. The, the limit between civilization and barbarism is internal to each civilization, which is why I think the legacy of Europe is more than ever universal. The threat comes from many sides. I'm not against Russia, not just from Russia. For example, I like these details which make me worry. On June 19th this year, there was a meeting of a convention of Texas Republicans. And they approved measures declaring that President Joe Biden is not legitimately elected. And so on and so on. They also voted on a platform that declares homosexuality an abnormal life choice and so on and so on. 
Now, I find this horrible. When an official party, which will maybe win next elections in the United States, declares that Biden was not legitimately elected, it's a clear step in the direction of, for the time being still called, civil war in the United States. And uh, if we combine this fact, the fact that there is no longer a neutral political space in the United States, it's kind of ideological civil war, they cannot even agree on rules. If you ask me what worries me most in the United States, it's, as you maybe know, uh, Republicans are pushing measures so that in single states of the United States, if anybody complains that the results of elections there are not clear, the Congress of that state can simply directly nominate delegates. This means maybe even real uh, civil war. But what worries me even more is that uh, with the Ukraine war fatigue, a dark prospect opens up. What if Trump wins next elections and enforces a pact with Russia, abandoning Ukrainians in the same way he did it with Kurds, Kurdistan? During the Maidan uprising, a telephone call was leaked of U.S. diplomat Victoria Nuland, who casually stated, fuck the EU, European Union. A clear signal that United States were pursuing its own goals in Ukraine. Putin is also for years consistently pursuing the politics of, sorry for the expression, fuck Europe, of dismantling the United Europe. He supported Brexit, Catalonian separatism, Le Pen in France, Salvini in Italy, and so on. This anti-European axis that unites Putin with certain trends in European and American politics is, again, one of the most dangerous elements in today's politics. And uh, here, although I'm not for war, but beware, here, Confronted with these tensions, abstract pacifism is not enough. We all want peace, but peace alone is not a term which allows us to draw key political differences. Occupiers always sincerely want peace in the territory they hold. Germany, for example, when it occupied France in 1940-44, they definitely wanted peace there. <laughs> peace means they do it. Uh, Israel definitely wants peace on the occupied West Bank and Russia is in a mission for peace in Ukraine. In a way, they are sincere, yes. Peace means for them, we occupy it all. So, what should we fight for? Here, I want to now comes a little bit of very simple philosophy. Here I want to recall the title of today's meeting, Power of Rules, Rules of Power. Which rules? The space of ideology or of customs that regulate our daily interactions is ambiguous and inconsistent. There are prohibitions we are expected to violate but discreetly not in public. And the obverse, there are freedoms that are given to us on condition that we don't use them. We are giving a, given a free choice if we make the right uh, choice. Are you aware to what extent our daily life is penetrated regulated by such unwritten rules. For example, I don't know how it is in other parts of Europe, but here in Slovenia, let's say I invite you to dinner. And let's say, which is unfortunately not true, that I have much more money than you. <laughs> if I invite you, of course. Yeah, it is clear that I will pay for dinner. But do you remember how things are here? Nonetheless, you are expected, when the bill arrives, you are expected to say, no, let me 
contribute a little bit, let's share it, and so on. We all know that I will pay. <laughs> In my evil, I often do this to friends just to shock them. I say, okay, you pay if you want, and then it's a... <laughs> But you know what I want to say here? This is, a, this is a beautiful example of everyday politeness. How you offer something and, of course, it's a fake offer. <laughs> but, and I want to tell you a story. Okay, you, you will stop me if I improvise a little bit, if I go too long. <laughs> One of true heroes of mine is a friend of mine who served the Yugoslav army in, like me, 75, 76. And after two weeks of initial training, there was a big ceremony where you had to sign the oath. And when he approached the officer with the big book, his name, he asked the officer, uh, is this obligatory or not? The officer told him no. Of course not. You, it's free for you to sign it or not. Then my friend said, then I will not sign it. Then the officer said, then you will be arrested. So the friend said, so what is it? And then my friend got a wonderful document because the officer was stupid. This was the compromise. The officer wrote him an official letter claiming, I order you to freely sign this document. <laughs> but this is not just a joke. This is, how, uh, this is how ideology functions. Another trick here, every diplomat knows this. We know which is my favorite saying about diplomats. When a diplomat says yes, he means maybe. When he says maybe, he means no. And now comes the beautiful paradox. When he says no, he's not a good diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, these are our daily lives. We have prohibitions. Bravo, uh, uh, be careful, you know. When I take power, I'm already making a list from Gul for Gulag, but that's another. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, seriously. Look. Let me give you another popular example of how unwritten rules work. In, uh, imagine, my favorite, ima you are the Central Committee of Soviet Party, 35, I'm Stalin. I give a speech, you applause, then somebody stands up and criticizes me. It's madness, he will disappear the next day. But then another guy stands up and says, to the first guy who criticized me, but are you crazy? Don't you know that in our country we don't do this? It's forbidden to criticize Stalin. He will disappear even faster. <laughs> you see the paradox. It was prohibited to criticize Stalin, but it was prohibited to announce publicly these prohibitions themselves. So what's my message to you? I'm not losing my track here. It's that the, let's call it, ethical substance, the substance of our interactions, of our daily exchanges, are not just written explicit rules. But you always have a higher level of rules which tell you how to obey rules, which rules you are even expected to secretly violate, which rules you are and, uh, or the opposite, which rules, even if they allow you something, you are basically prohibited to, uh, to, uh, to, to use these freedoms promised by these rules. And I think this was the big problem in the last decades in Russia. Friends from Russia told me that in Yeltsin years, there was a big mess. Because under Soviet Union, you have rules, and then there were very clear unwritten rules. For example, whom you have to bribe, uh, where you can cheat or not. In Yeltsin years, people didn't know what are the unwritten rules. That's why, as my friend convinced me, even mafia and gangster organizations played a positive role. 
because they were a kind of ersatz law structure. You turn to a local mafia and they explain it to you. You want this, okay, we will contact that gang and so on. With Putin, we have new rules. They are clear now, even almost as oppressive, if not more, than under the Soviet Union. But I think that uh, now we have new rules, but I think that in international politics, we have not yet reached that stage. Back in the 90s, in Yeltsin years, a silent pact was regulating the relationship between Western great powers and Russia. Western states treated Russia as a great power on condition that Russia didn't effectively act as one. That was the silent rule. And under Putin, this silent rule was violated, and, and now uh, we don't know where we are. That's one problem. The second problem uh, connected with this one also concerns the fate of unwritten rules in our so-called developed Western countries. Uh, remember Donald Trump. He more or less stuck to explicit legal regulations, but he tended to ignore the unwritten silent pacts which determine how we should practice these rules. That was one thing, you know, that was for me so interesting and horrible about Trump. It's not so much that he violated explicit rules, but with every rule comes certain manners, silent rules, how you do this, how you do that. He violated all that. Another thing, everybody knows this, not only with Trump, but with so-called alternative right, new conservatives, is that, and I find this uh, very sad, it's that uh, uh, when I was young, leftists like to speak with obscene terms, making obscene signs, using F-word and so on, like we are the subversive one, while those in power played the game of dignity, politeness. Did you notice that Today, it's almost the opposite. The old right is getting more and more explicitly obscene. I don't want to lose your time here. Just two very briefly examples. One is at one public meeting, Trump imitated, because he was listening to her tape, an FBI agent who was he taped this, making love with her partner and imitated her orgasm. Or, uh, 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 or uh, 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 there are other similar uh, examples of open, direct obscenity. This was unimaginable 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so, uh, uh, what's the problem here? I think that uh, in his interpretation of the fall of East European communism, Jürgen Habermas, who was at least close to an official philosopher of European Union, uh, accepted the fact that the existing liberal democratic order is the best one possible. And that uh, while we should strive to make it more just, we should not challenge its basic premises. I think that, so he, Habermas, sorry, uh, understood Central and East European revolutions in the sense of getting rid of communism as something that was just rectifying or catching up with the West. He called them Nachholende Revolution, catch up revolution. The aim being of them was for Habermas to establish in Eastern Europe what the West already had. I'm sorry, I'm, and this is, I think, the challenge for Europe today, I'm a little bit more pessimist. I think that also in Western Europe, from Gilets Jeunes, Yellow Vests in France, the protest in Spain, and other similar protests, we have some kind of dissatisfaction precisely with the 
standard multi-party liberal democratic system. We have some kind of discontent which it is not possible to translate into institutions or public space of political establishment. You know, uh, when there, there were the last elections won by Tony Blair, I remember I was there in England two weeks before the elections, and uh, there was a big almost referendum, tens of thousands of people voting who is the most unpopular person in the United Kingdom. Tony Blair won. Two weeks afterwards, he won the elections. This is horrible for me. This means there is a gap like yellow vests in France. It was not possible to translate their, to translate their discontent into political forum. So now, Today, we now, if you allow me again, a little bit more philosophy, but it's crucial. I think that uh, the paradox today is best expressed by the shock of some of my friends. A year and a half ago, you remember, the 6th of January, the crowd penetrates the capital. My friends, leftists, naive leftists, were telling me, this is wonderful, uh, uh, people breaking into the seat of power and so on, just we should have been doing this, the wrong people are doing this. That's our reality today. Let's face it, the old right, alternative right, is consciously, even some of them, is speaking the language and even acting like the old uh, radical left. And they are conscious of this link. Steve Bannon, the big uh, Trump supporter, calls himself a Leninist. He said, my ideas are, are what the leftists were doing 20 years ago, and so on. So why can, cannot we, let's call it the civilized, social democratic mainstream, why cannot we counteract? It's not that we are too passive. There is something deeper here. For me, the saddest lesson of the experience of pandemic is how our societies, and that was the difference between West and East. That's why in, from China to India, in all those countries, it was much easier for them to deal with the, uh, the pandemic, because they still could rely on public rituals of mourning, trauer. They were, they, today, our reaction was uh, uh, private disclosures on Facebooks and so on, impossibility of collective mourning. Here, I want to introduce another category that I hope you will like. It's for me a crucial category to understand where we are today, developed by my good friend, Austrian philosopher Robert Faller, uh, uh, interpassivity. This doesn't mean the other acts for me, but that the other is passive for me. And this is not for me a form of alienation, it's very precious. And a simple example, I know I visited there are some parts of Europe, like in south of Peloponnese, where they still have what they call weepers. Women that you pay to cry for you. I don't think this is alienation. I think this is something wonderful. In a human sense, it doesn't mean hypocrisy. It means when your beloved dies, you are in such a deep shock that you cannot perform the ritual, so you pay another to cry for you. Now you will say, oh, of course, the extreme case here are Tibetan prayer meals, you know. You write a prayer on a piece of paper, you turn it around, and you are praying in this way, even if you think about nasty sexual sins or whatever. Now you will say, yeah, this goes for primitive countries. Ha ha. What is the greatest contribution of American culture in 20th century to world civilization. I think seriously, it is something that is called canned laughter. You know what is this? Laughter included into the soundtrack. And I find this something wonderful. 
At least I fall for it. In the evening, I return home. I'm too tired even to laugh. I put on some stupid series and I watch tired. The, the TV machine is laughing for me. And I feel relaxed in exactly the same way as if I was laughing. I think this is great civilization that you can externalize your feelings. Today, we are not able we are not able to do it no longer uh, this is why we are i'm trying to go right? yeah yeah this is <laughs> but no like uh, i'm against this metaphorical notion of linear time so the time can be expanded and so on you know. y yes but no but Gulag. Okay, let's go on. No, no, something very serious. Peter? Did you notice? I will. Uh, I, I, I am approaching. The no, no, end. but no. I, I asked Peter to to bring some uh, glasses of wine, please. Yeah. Could you? This is typical. No, for, but I mean, we for speak, contemporary we, French people, we, we I speak, give them deep thoughts. They think about alcohol. Okay. No, we speak. We speak about party spirit. This is Europe, and Europe is wine. Don't mention France. France is for me, that's why I love it, a country whose entire cuisine is based on turning a failure into success. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? You know what is champagne? Champagne is, you, had, you wanted to have wine, wine fermented, got rotten, and you said, okay, it's champagne, it's even better. You, you make cheese, Savoy, Savoy. the cheese got Cheers. rotten, and you say, okay, we have this rotten cheese, it, it's our specialty, so don't try to sell me your stuff. Okay, let's go, sorry. Ma now, much more seriously. Uh, this problem with passivity is a great one for our liberal societies, because it's no longer that we don't know what is happening. We know very well what is happening. Look at those disgusting big meetings. Why disgusting? Because they talk in a way that you can be sure nothing will be done. You remember the Glasgow, the Glasgow meeting uh, of uh, Prince Charles, everybody? Everything they said was true. It's five minutes to 12, we need to act, and exactly nothing happened. <laughs> so uh, uh, now, uh, I don't want to go, so we not only know what is wrong, all the crises we are in, we know what has to be done, but you know what, I'm sorry, I don't have the time to develop it, I'm really cutting it short, but uh, do you know what's the problem here? Uh, the problem is that our knowing it itself functions like an ersatz as a fetish in psychoanalytic terms. I know something, you tell me, why don't you do it? And I say, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know, you know. Knowledge itself about what has to be done is evoked instead of, is evoked instead of doing it. This is what I call, read my books if you want to know more, the cynical mode of ideology. As again, Peter Sloterdijk wrote, in his formula of cynical reason, I know what I'm doing, but I am nonetheless uh, doing it. And that's our problem today. We have big crises, which for me remind me of the four riders of the apocalypse in the book of Revelations. Plague, war, hunger, death. Plague, a pandemia, war, Russian attack on Ukraine, and so on. Hunger, with global warming, we know what is coming, and death. What kind of death? I don't mean the empirical death, although people are dying. I mean something much more ominous, and that should worry you. Uh, as for ordinary death, it's part of life. My favorite definition of life is a Polish graffiti, I think. I love it. It says, life is a disease which is transmitted by sex and always ends with death. It's the best definition of life. But I'm talking about other, another thing here. Uh, uh, first, we have digital control over our lives with so-called surveillance capitalism. Then we have already the possibility to 
intervene into our DNA to change, and the next step will be we are close to it. You don't read a lot. So-called wired brain. Direct interaction between computer, machine, and our line of thoughts. What will this mean? Will we still be human after all of this? So, if you permit me just the final conclusion. Okay, no, no, I will do something really evil against you. Uh, Please you know, do. Now we will say it's the end. I will say yes, and I start with the discussion with, by asking myself, so what is the conclusion of all of this? And I will answer very briefly. No, my first conclusion is that we don't need the old communism. I'm not crazy. It was even more inefficient. But all these problems, immigrants, war, uh, global warming, isn't it clear that a much stronger, wider collaboration will be needed? And the only model for this in the world today that I see is Europe, again. But uh, just to conclude, to return nonetheless to, topic, to the topic which is in front of our eyes all the days, uh, the ongoing war. What worried me is that uh, a couple of days or weeks ago, when a new tension erupted in northern Kosovo, Vladimir Djokanovic from the ruling Serbian Progressive Party wrote on Twitter that, I quote, Serbia might be forced to engage in the denazification of the Balkans. You see how this name Denazification is gradually spreading. First to Ukraine, now not just to Kosovo, to Balkans, which means Bos Bosnia included, and so on, and so on. So, uh, this is, uh, and behind this, that's why I take Russia seriously. Uh, it's not just uh, what Russia is now doing, it's not just a simple big justification for, to get a small piece of land in Ukraine. I don't under, never underestimate ideology. There is a big theological political vision. Or, to quote Alexander Dugin, we are fighting the absolute evil embodied in Western civilization, its liberal totalitarian hegemony in, embodied in Ukrainian Nazism. Uh, now, uh, if you allow me, just, uh, what I want to say is that uh, this is what really worries me, and this will be my concluding point. It's how we have this absolute religious fundamentalism, but combined with more or less open obscenity. This is, for me, the truth of the new populist right. What do I mean by this? Let me conclude with a very shocking example. It's really tasteless, but I'm sorry. This is what happened, you know where, not in a private pub, but on the floor of American Senate, where Todd Akin, Akin I didn't know how to pronounce it, a, a Republican Senate nominee introduced the category of legitimate rape. I'm sorry for these details, but I want to shock you with them. His reasoning, again, developed not in some uh, bar after the meeting, but there on the big podium, is that cases of real rape are almost impossible because to penetrate the woman, the woman has to get, sorry for the vulgarity, wet or whatever, uh, relax her muscles, and this signals if she is aware it or not that she accepted sex. I find this category terrifying. Uh, why do I mention it here? First, because always be attentive to how with this new old alternative fundamentalist theologist, Christianity fake Christianity, but nonetheless, Christian fundamentalism is uh, connected with extreme racist, anti-feminist uh, vulgarity. And I just want to warn you that uh, 
Putin used, apropos of Ukraine, the same metaphor of rape. When he announced the invasion, he quoted a Soviet era punk rock group Red Mold, and from their song, Sleeping Beauty in a Coffin, here are the lines, Sleeping Beauty in a Coffin, I crept up and fucked her, like it or dislike it, sleep my beauty. Like, you will get if you want it or not. So, uh, uh, such male chauvinist obscenities are the, not even so hidden, truth of the proponents today, unfortunately, of populist Christian values. So my point is that what Putin and that Serb delegate, member of parliament, are talking is precisely what we can call the legitimate rape of a country. But this is not all, just really the conclusion, this is not all about, we should say, about Putin. You know, I know friends who know friends who know friends who at the end know the right people. And from them I learned that what is Putin now doing is very interesting. He doesn't have only Dugin and these theological conservative advisors. He mobilized a Marxist group which provides to him elements for how to justify Russian politics in the eyes of Africans, Latino Americans, and so on. The idea is that to play the card against Western colonization, the idea is Western liberalism is the true totalitarianism, and they go to the end. I read a wonderful text by a Russian journalist who said we were reading Orwell in a wrong way. The target of Orwell is Western liberalism, not Stalinism, and so on. So, uh, uh, the idea is that Russia is decolonizing all the world by breaking Western hegemony uh, and by allowing each country to enjoy full sovereignty based on their own distinct identity, traditions, and values. Now, what this means, we know respect for distinct identity, it means, and this is the world we are approaching. It made me really sad. Do you remember after Taliban took over Afghanistan, there was immediate pact between Taliban and China. The deal was very simple. We, Chinese, allow you to do whatever you want with women there. You allow us to do with Uyghurs, <laughs> Muslims, whatever we want, uh, whatever we want here. But what I want to say is that this image of decolonization is not really a leftist one. It is a key component of alt-right movements around the way. Marine Le Pen also, last page, I must explain. Marine Le Pen also uh, presents herself as the protector of ordinary working people against the big international corporations which promote multiculturalism and sexual depravity to undermine national identities, and so on and so on. So uh, we have, it's interesting to read today's old right, they like to begin almost like Marxist, class struggle, we protect ordinary people, and so on. And then, of course, you end up with racism, and so on. Remember here, this is for me not an argument against uh, 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 socialism. Remember that Hitler's party was called National Socialist Germans Workers Party. So things are here much more problematic. But Putin at least makes it clear. Did you read, concluding thoughts really, did you read Putin's uh, uh, speech two days before invasion, on 21st of February, where he mocked Ukrainians uh, destroying Lenin's statues? And he says, literally, you Ukrainians, you say you want to decommunize your country. And he said, Perfect. We totally agree with you. But you are not radical enough. Wait for us and we will really decommunize you. And as a leftist, that's why I support Ukraine totally. 
Because remember something. How can leftists fall for this bullshit if you support Ukraine, you support NATO militarism? Don't you remember in his speech on the 21st of February, Putin mentioned only one name critically. You remember whom? Lenin. He said, Ukraine is Lenin's invention. And we can say many things critical about Lenin, but here he was radical enough. He was for total autonomy of Ukraine, inclusive of the right to full sovereignty to leave the Union of Soviet Republics or whatever it was, it was called. So, uh, even if Ukraine will hopefully protect its independence, uh, I think their eventual victory will be their moment of truth. They will have to learn the lesson that it is not enough to catch up with the West and join the EU. West itself is in a deep crisis. There is a deep discontent in Western liberal democracies. Not only illiberal authoritarianism, but also this inability of liberal democracy to function properly and last sentence, seriously. That's why I think don't be patronizing towards Ukrainians. It's not, yes, they are a little bit crazy, but we should support them so that they will join us. No, it's not only that they need us, our help. We need them in the sense that they are a unique chance for us, Europe, to awaken from this dogmatic slumber, sleep of inactivity. We really got to passive. We need a mobilization, not primarily in the military sense, but these times of comfortable liberal hedonism are over. We will have crises immigrants, uh, uh, food crisis, we don't know what, and uh, the easy time is over. That's the lesson we have to learn from Ukraine. Not, it's not enough to help Ukraine. Europe itself will have to reinvent itself, and here, again, Ukraine plays an extremely positive role. Because, again, they are, in some sense, more European than we, many of us, in daily life ourselves. We say, yeah, yeah, Europe is great, but we are lost in total non-engagement, talking about things, doing nothing, and so on. And it's like our conscience speaking. I'm not idealizing Ukrainians. If you want, in the debate, I can tell you 20 things. I have a list what they were doing wrong. But nonetheless, they see in us, when they claim they fight for Europe, something that we ourselves lost in our pragmatism, which is horrible pragmatism, like the logic even of some leftists is, okay, we should be for peace, let's not give arms to Ukraine, because if we do this, we may pay 10% more for electricity or whatever. It's an extremely egotist approach on which uh, Putin counts. So I think that Ukraine should serve us to become aware of, my God, we know we are corrupted, sleepy, and so on, but what do they see in us? Let's try to live up to what poor Ukraine, with all its problems, oligarchs, corruption, sees in us Europe. That's why, again, Ukraine is a chance for all of us, for a stronger, more cooperative Europe. Thank you very much. Slavoj, may I take a pre-introduction? Ah, you, after my talk, you want to do the introduction. No, a pre-introduction. Just, okay. just to say a word. Earlier today, uh, earlier today, I, I met a civil servant. And I, I knew the guy. We, we signed a paper 
one or two years ago. In fact, I did not know the guy when we signed the paper, and it was not you. It was a diplomat. And in this paper, we said we need to organize as European in, orga, in order to fight autocracy. We mean Russia and China. But also for the West. Yes. This guy is a Slovenian diplomat. He was in charge of many topics in the ministry, and he told me the day I signed this paper, I see Tania and maybe she knows who it is about. The day I signed this paper, I lost my mission, I lost my job. And I was in a corridor in the minister, and I met only five persons a week. Nobody wanted to speak to me. Now he has a very important job, and he has five persons every hour in his office. And just to remember what he told me, it's not Tian Sha who uh, said the people not to come to my office or to ask or who asked to take my, uh, my mission. It's the people who thought that this would please Yan Sha. And this is the way, step by step, Putin in Russia developed this autocratic process which changed Russian society. When I see this room, and when I think one year before, I see people who are living with a party spirit, and, party, and some of you drinking wine. I'm not sure this would have been possible one year ago, because I did not see anybody doing that. But I do mean the European spirit is fighting against these facilities. Sorry, by European state, you mean EU? European, European, Europe, European spirit, not European state. Uh -huh. And we, we, we can speak about the European state a bit later. Uh -huh. But this European spirit is fighting against these facilities to accept, to neglect people, to put people aside. It's laughing as you, are, as you were laughing. It's smiling. It's having wine. This is the party spirit. And this is deeply Europe. And we are Europe because we have a party spirit since the Renaissance. And this is ourselves. And this is what I wanted to share as a pre-introduction. But now, let me uh, come back to what you have said. And finally, if I have to sum up in two words what you have said at the end of your speech, it is thank you, Zelensky. Thank you, Zelensky, because last March, in the European Parliament, you have said what no European leader, and we should ask why, is capable of saying. Europe, or more exactly the EU, is a new civilization. Is a new civilization which privileges equality, which privileges dignity, which privileges respect, which privileges spirit against power. And we, Ukrainians, are the protection of this civilization. And civilization for decades, and for reasons that we can understand, was a prohibition, a forbidden word in Europe. Because civilization was attached to colonization, yeah, yeah. to Shoah, to many things. But you like Sloterdijk, and Sloterdijk is explaining to us that we are in a war of narrative, and the war of narrative is a war of civilization. So we need to rehabilitate the word civilization and to give him the meaning we want to give, which is a civilization which replaces war, intermittent war by perpetual peace. This is a Kant project, which replaces force by law, 
which replace unlimited power by dignity of the human being. And this is exactly the European project. And what is the EU? The EU is the concrete, the political embodiment of this civilization. And once you say that, you think that the EU is a very, very dangerous model for Russia, for China, and for everybody who want to contest any kind of universalism. But also for old, uh, old alternative right in the United States and so on. And you are right. One topic is in the United States, there are many people who are against Europe because Europe stands for somehow a new kind of success. And America, when you look at America today, America is a failure. There is a huge fragmentation. The American dream is for a very limited number of people. And the American society, in fact, is a combination of community. And when we speak about this new European civilization, for me, it's two things. On the one side, it is what we could call a great society. Like there was a Roman or a Greek society. It's very funny because uh, um, Nobel Prize Krugman, who was quite Eurosceptical. Last time he came in Europe some months ago, he said, but from Ljubljana to Vilnius to Lisbon, I see a European society. Mm -hmm. And we have built, without being aware, as you said earlier, a great European society of people sharing a European style of being, um, common rules, common conduct, same concern with regard to the future. And this is huge. Uh, just for the fun, uh, the day before I was in a plane and I was close to uh, the American coach of uh, the climbing, the, the US climbing um, team. And there is a competition in, in uh, Slovenia at the end of the week. And he told me, Hey, Europe for me is very clear. European, you have style. We have lost the style in the US. You, you are fit. You are mobile. Uh, you have good food. Culture is everywhere. You have solidarity. This is Europe. This is very clear. It's not anymore the US. So we have built a strong society, but we are not able to see it. And this is one thing. This is one part of this new civilization. And the second part is what Norbert Elias, because you mentioned this European state, calls the European state. In fact, it is the capacity to develop between nation states cooperation. Cooperation, cooperation. And Norbert Elias, after last war, said the, the next step of civilization is to invent better cooperation between nation states in order to protect citizens and to create the condition for the fulfillment of, of people. And this, and the place to develop that, the lab for that, will be Europe. And I name that the European state, l'État européen, as Norbert Elias said. And I think we have been successful in that. So, in fact, nowadays, and I want your opinion on that, we have developed a new civilization based upon a great society and a new solidarity with European state. And now the question is, how do we go ahead? How can we build something where we develop a real pride of it. Slavoj. Uh, you disagree? Sorry? Do you disagree? 
no, I say I always agree in principle, but... And but, no. yeah, so, so, so it was no, uh, no, no. a way to... I, it's very important what you say. Let me just add, uh, uh, it's just between the two of us, or uh, are we Stalinist, which I am, which means why allow people to speak when we are better than them to speak for their interests? Or it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a okay, good no, but should sorry, we, should okay, we answer we'll it or not no, yet? I would like to get some reaction, but let me say one it, thing. It will yeah, come. Yeah, I especially liked, I don't know, did you do this consciously or not, that you emphasized civilization, because in typical, much darker European way, this is the traditional German view. You find it in young Thomas Mann, who was uh, much more to the right than later, claiming French are civilization, which means polite manners, rules, but without depth, and Germans are culture, the deepest culture. I am for, I am here, I am for civilization. Uh, you saw that I combine the both. Yeah, but I, I believe one has to make a choice, and I will give you an example. First, I especially like your notion of dignity. You know what shocked me so much? I am following this new, they're incredibly important, I think. Let's call them a radical leftist, but very civilized movements. Now they won in three Latino American countries. Chile, Bolivia, Colombia. And it's not known here, but I was extremely engaged there. I did, in my broken Spanish uh, electoral short speech for each of them. And you know what shocked me? You know what is, as if they were quoting you, the basic signifier, word, their program focused on. Not freedom, not welfare, but dignity. But dignity is the core of Europe. Yeah, because yeah, they we all emphasize, even the same I learned, you remember a couple of years ago, there were big protests in Istanbul against uh, Erdogan? Yes. The word was dignity, again. And this is, I think, something simply wonderful. And even, uh, again, for, uh, forgive me to mention Lenin again, I'm very critical of him, he was laying the foundations for Stalinism. But there is a beautiful letter from 22, the old desperate Lenin, when he, as it were, quotes you, he says, let's not dream about socialism. It's nonsense to say about He said, all we can do is to bring into, he says this in 22, to bring to Russia as much as possible of Western civilization. She uses this term. Today, to say this, one would be immediately accused of neocolonialism or whatever. So what I want, uh, uh, what I want to say is that uh, by civilization, I mean precisely what I referred to as this complex texture of unwritten rules, everyday manners, and so on and so on. That's why uh, I couldn't believe it, but it almost made me cry when I learned, and then I met Adam Michnik, and he confirmed this to me, that, you know, that already when they were in uh, uh, 1988 or whatever, nine negotiations between Jaruzelski and Solidarnost, they become friends personal friends, Jaruzelski and Adam Michnik. And they were close friends, going to holidays together with their family. That's civilization. That's Unfortunately, I cannot imagine this here in Slovenia. Will you see Kuchan and Jansha have a holiday <laughs> together or whatever? But no, sorry, seriously. And I also deeply agree with you, critical point will come immediately, uh, that uh, U.S. is a failure. Maybe you know him, my friend, also the Lacanian linguist Jean-Claude Milner. He said in a wonderful book that U.S. is still a failed project, the troubles they still have now with the old right means that not only the revolution, but the civil war is not yet over really there. U.S., I mean, is an unfinished project here. And again, to quote Sloterdijk, what you said, 
You know, Sloterdijk is an incredible guy. He sounds conservative, but sometimes he says such a wonderful thing, like he draws attention to this, that till now, our entire ethics is based on sacrifice for your state in war as the highest ethical duty. Like we all follow our daily interest, earn money, good living, but from time to time your country calls you and that's the highest ethical moment. And Sloterdijk says, no, the time has come to civilize the, civilized the animal called nation, you know. That till now there was ethics within a nation, but when there is war between nations, it's force. To use the terms of the title here, rules are no longer valid and so on and so on. And Sloterdijk sees this very clearly. Okay, not to lose time, where I would only be a little bit more skeptical is, yes, it's nice what you say about Europe, but you know, Europe also has its dark sides which cannot be, I think, simply dismissed as, I don't know, remainder from before and so on and so on. I mean, Austria, the nicest, most gentle country in Europe, gave birth to a certain guy close to Linz, I think, Hitler and so on. No, you know what I mean here? I mean this. You know where I would be more skeptical than you? That's why I emphasized so much the unwritten rules and so on. When you said that you, if you sign this, you would disappear or whatever, no? I'm more of a pessimist. I think in Europe, we are often in a position where, yes, you sign all this, Europe civilization and so what? Nothing happens, that's my... Pe or to give you, I'm sorry, half of you must know it, but it's my best example of what I call... Uh, uh, I call manners in the sense of beliefs, but not beliefs which are your explicit beliefs, but beliefs which you practice in your life. You know the story, but I want to repeat it. Niels Bohr the true European genius. You know, you must know the story. I repeat it all the time. Once he was visited by a friend at his country house and the friend saw horseshoe, the superstitious sign above the entrance to his house. And the friend told him, but this is superstition. It's supposed to pre prevent evil spirits to enter the house. Why do you have it there? Do you believe in it? You, and Bohr gave a perfect answer. He said, I'm a scientist. Of course, I don't believe in it. But I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> and that's, I think, unfortunately, the logic of many of us. You participate in democracy, but you don't believe it. You don't want to engage too much, too much into it. So again, uh, don't underestimate it the extent to which barbarism can also be presented with a civilized space. Let me give you an example, very brutal one, very short, then you will have the concluding word. Uh, I will no, no, no. react for you the... Know, immediately. You know, for example, it shocked me that John Locke, the great English uh, Enlightenment philosopher, gave a very leftist, almost Marxist, justification of killing the Native Americans, so-called Indians, and uh, throwing them off their land. His logic was this one, very Marxist. The land should be possessed by those who work on it and probably cultivate it. Now, he said the problem with Native Americans is that they have all these vast plains, but they don't properly develop agriculture and so on. So we Europeans have the right to throw them out because we will properly develop the world. So you see how even the best enlightened idea can be. So I'm just a little bit more pessimist here. Pessimist in the sense that there is no guarantee that as we amply see today with all the calls to action and so on, ecological action, nothing serious is 
happening. You know, I agree deeply with your idea of Europe, and the only conclusion I have is a very pessimist one. I'm sorry. Maybe we need more catastrophes to awaken us. Maybe we didn't suffer enough. I'm sorry. So, there will be a question later. <laughs> uh, I thought so you wanted to... Let, uh, me, <laughs> let me a bit, uh, Marxist. Um, several reactions. Uh, first of all, uh, something very important. If we look at Republican, because we, you like them very much, if we look at China, if we look at Russia, if we look at India today, we see that they are rewriting the story and the history. Yeah. In Europe, and maybe this is a positive touch, we have a critical distance of the history. And this is very important. We have a critical thinking. And I would say more. We have 27 critical thinking because we are discussing all the time of the right version of the story. And this is very important because somehow it's a protection. One challenge. You spoke about Valeza, Mishnik, but you could have mentioned Giremek. I know. No, sorry, I wanted to, not Michnik Valenza, but also Michnik and Jaruzelski. And Jaru Jaruzelski and the relationship. But what is really interesting, because many people say uh, Poland is like uh, Hungary, etc. No, Poland is not like Hungary. It will be back a liberal country. I have no doubt about that. But what was very important with uh, Giremek, who was also a founder of Solidarność, mm -hmm and who was Minister of Foreign Affairs, member of uh, mm -hmm. European Parliament, his, his capacity, wherever he, he was in Europe, to say this village, this family, they have a European history. And he was capable to connect a village, to connect a family European-wide, mm -hmm. and to tell a wider story. And this is very important, because if we are able to do that, we will be able to be through European, and we will be able to build all together a positive future. Second reaction about what you have said, and about people. You don't know, but I fought for the organization of this conference on the future of Europe. And in order to organize it and to convince decision makers that this was required, we uh, launched a massive consultation of 48 million Europeans. We Europeans, we called it. And we asked one question to these people. What should we do? What would you do if you were in charge of the future of Europe? And what was very interesting is, first of all, people all over Europe in the 27 countries, in 25 languages, answer massively. And second, everywhere in Europe, they answer more or less the same thing. We want a sustainable de development, we want democracy, and we want to participate more and more. We want a stronger social dimension with health. We want to regulate the tech company and the huge multinational. And we want education. And this was from Vilnius to Lisbon, passing that Vassav to Paris. So that is very interesting. And there was this conference on, on the future of Europe. Nobody spoke about it. But they were 1,000 people sorted, and which is very interesting is 95% of the people sorted did not know anything about Europe, but they accepted to participate to this exercise for one year. Spontaneously, they wanted to try to be European citizen. To be honest, they did not like at all. You were a member of the parliament at that time, I think. European parliament at that time. Yeah. To be completely honest, they did not like so much politicians who with they interfere. But they developed a common understanding of the European challenge. And all of them said, we need a European civic education. 
we need to involve all citizens in the future of Europe, and we need to complement parliamentary democracy by citizen democracy. And I think this exercise and the behavior of citizens is really interesting, and it gives somehow a signal of optimism. Third remark, and I conclude. I do agree. We have been too much Monekine, Jean Monekine. We, Europe has been something which has been too long a technocratic project. It needs to become more a political project. But what does it mean? It does mean that we, we need to reinvite Machiavelli in the game. And that we need not to wait for the US, China, and the other. But we, we have to do as Machiavelli suggested. We need to take the lead in order to implement the new order of things we want. And this is leadership, and this is politics. And I think this is a European challenge, and it requires one thing, leadership. But leadership not only for political leaders, leadership for each of us. If I can find a formula, I maybe would say each citizen must behave as a political leader and each political leader must think as a citizen. It sounds nice, again. But you are going to disagree. No, 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 not, where not is the but? totally, but, where you is know, the but? my God, I'm supposed to be the crazy, sorry, I should do that. Uh, am I so crazy? I'm supposed to be the crazy philosopher, but I'm much more brutal realist. It's not a, a right, the right term here. Uh, let, me, let me give you this example. It will sound... First, I deeply agree with what you said about rewriting of history. You know who is my model here? Do you know this story? It's a wonderful moment. In 53, where there were in Geneva... I don't remember. Sorry? I don't remember. I do, even if I was not there, <laughs> because the collective memory speak to what <laughs> ah, yeah. through me. The, okay, but seriously, Chu and Lai was there to finish the negotiations about uh, Korea, peace in Korea. And he was asked by a French journalist, what do you think about French Revolution? You know what Chu and Lai's answer was? It's too early to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yet far enough. And he was deeply right. Because what happened in 1989, exactly 200 years after, was something that triggered, at least in the mainstream liberals and right-wingers, a rewriting of history. They claimed French Revolution, especially in his Jacobin Forum, is the origin of this revolutionary logic, whose final failure was to, came 200 years later. I don't agree with that, but I agree with you. This is a beautiful formula proposed by Walter Benjamin, the German, how do we call it, fellow traveler of Marxism, who said that every emancipatory movement is also a struggle to redeem the past. We are always in this sense, rewriting the past, giving new meaning to it. Now comes my pessimism. You know, what if I, in contrast to this, we are all citizens, leaders, blah, blah, blah. No, I think that... Let me ask you a frank... I simplify it, and I want no. to provoke you to attack me more. Question. I... I definitely wouldn't like to live in a country where a true self-management would have been operative. Like, you know, I work in the morning, every afternoon. I have to participate in some local stupid meetings where we decide how our children are educated, how we organize. I want to have a society of some basic, well-functioning alienation. I want peace. I want an invisible network of state
to smoothly function. Of course, not totally out of control, but now I will go even a step further. I think, trigger warning, as they say in politically correct societies, provocation, that most of the people, this is an attack on you, but I hope I will get a counterattack. People don't really want democracy, if by democracy you mean they really decide. People want the appearance of democracy. They want the appearance to be asked, what do you want? But at the same time, they want clearly to be told, what do they want? And I think this is the role of a good leader. Not, uh, you know, a good leader is not the one who simply orders you what you want. It's uh, when we are, now comes my provocation, but I love it, I agree with it. A true leader is not a master who controls you. Uh, on the contrary, in your everyday life, if you are a stupid, hedonist, pragmatic individualist, you are not really free. You are caught in your daily routine. A true leader liberates you. A true leader makes you aware of, my God, I thought this is not possible, but I can do this. So we need a leader to make us aware that it's possible to do things we thought it's not possible. Now, I don't want to make judgments who knows what is Zelensky really, but there was an element of this leader in him because let's be frankly critical. How stupid we were a couple of months ago. First we thought, all my political friends were telling me this. Listen, Putin is bluffing, don't worry, he will never attack. Then when he attacked, the same friends were telling me, listen, be serious. Kiev will fall in two, three days and it will be all over. And so on and so on. And uh, uh, there was some shocking surprise. This is what I like about Ukrainians. Yet it was madness, impossible. But, but they did it. But nonetheless, ask yourself again, isn't it that when there are elections, when things are really decided, we are usually afraid of those moments. It's almost like civil war. Like in Europe, we came close to radical election with Syriza, I think. And people were afraid. Will there be civil war and so on and so on? So ag again, uh, I, I, as an ordinary conformist, here comes my provocation. I don't want to lose my time thinking too much about a society. I want some basic assurance that, of course, that those in power are somehow controlled, but I don't want to know too much. I want to have my peaceful life, to read books, write books, watch good movies, listen to good music, and so on. And I just want society, for example, I don't want to know too much about healthcare. I want it to function a little bit better than it's functioning in my country now, and so on, and so on. So I'm provoking you now with a category of good alienation. Not in the sense of no, no, alienated no. power, but in the sense of there is a basically alienated state structure, and the best thing that can happen is that you somehow basically trust it. Do you have a problem with this? So yes, tell me why. Say so, so all thing. First, first about leadership. Yeah. My, my definition of leadership converges with yours. For me, a leader is somebody who opens the universe of possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is very important because for me, this is also the European dream to be able for anybody to open the universe of possible. So that's leadership. But you have forgotten some, some, something regarding democracy. The fact is people, they are working a lot, but they are working less and less and less in the medium long term. And they have a lot of time. So they have time to read books, they have time to go to cinema, to have sex, to look after our family, etc. But they are also interested 
in what's happening in daily life. And politics and democracy is part. And they want, I do agree, they want to participate. And they want to be included. And they don't want to be excluded. So the role of politics and of politicians is to find the way to involve them. What I have said exactly is we need traditional democracy, parliamentary democracy, but we need to complement it because we are in a time where, in which it is enough time to contribute to participate. So we need to find the balance. This is my position and I think this is very European and it's really funny because when you give an opportunity for a citizen to be a real citizen and to think about, to contribute to the thinking of the future, it takes the time. It takes the time. So it's interesting. It's in I would not say everybody would do that. I would not say if you do it once in your life, you are going to do it again. But it's an experience of universality. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's the same line, just if you can. Okay, where would you so, locate so do, do here you... uh, Gilets Jean, uh, Yellow West? There you got the real voice of the people, and it was, it was a mixture of yeah, leftist proposals, racist proposals, and no, so on. The, there the people spoke, and it was a big mess. Okay, but because there was... It was in France, no? So what? <laughs> you think France is a big mess? No, no, it, no but I, I, I mean, in my country, because we, have, we are a very presidential regime, we have not the culture, the real culture of listening to the people. It's a really top-down country for decades and decades and decades. And we have difficulty to manage the crisis. So sometimes every 70 years or we have war or revolution and it helps to manage the transformation. But it is, it, it is, it is, it, it is France, I would say. Um, can I change topics? You are the boss, okay. Yeah. I, I just want, and after we, we will go to the question, I, I just want to say a, a very quick word about Taiwan. Because we spoke about universality. Yeah. And for me, Taiwan is the proof that European values are not only European, but they are universal. And this, this is very important. I wanted to share that with you. And then we take one question or two, and we go to bed. Uh, we can't listen to you at all. My God. Micro. Ah, blah, blah. Does this work? <laughs> or, no, because I would be ready to give it to you. Like, oh, okay. Can you give, me a, give him a microphone? Thank you. Is coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just repeat, my name is Ibrahim, and uh, I, I repeat what I say before, that uh, I say uh, thanks to the organizer to invite me, and also... I congratulate you for this uh, brilliant and uh, lively uh, inter intervention. And we have a, a cocktail of good ideas and also bad ideas. Uh, so <clears throat> I just want to tell my contribution, what I can do. Uh, I just want to tell you that the situation are very serious in this moment. Uh, there is no joke now. We have to decide what uh, we want in this world. As we want to collapse or we want to survive. And uh, on, my, on my side, this life is so beautiful for me that I want to live for maybe hundreds of years, for two days. And uh, it's also very serious that you know that people are dying in Ukraine, people are dying in Mali, in Somalia, in uh, so on, so I can, you know, your situation. So we have to decide and we say that. Europe have a future of Europe. The future of Europe for me is that Europe have to listen to others. For the past 400 years, just Europe is talking. Other people, other nations, they don't exist. If, if they want to exist, Europe say no. Because Europe don't give an opportunity as you give me that I can talk. Uh, if you see why, how, why your dialogue? The dialogue is that we are in a crisis, and the solution is you know, this world are not only in Europe, 
I think we, I think we, we understood your, your intervention and your question. Do you want to react no, and uh, conclude? Because it's no, time I was said. <laughs> no, I just stopped. No, no, but you, you, you have stopped. But, uh, okay. Oh, no, sorry, I would sorry. like to go. I'm so sorry. I know people are dying here. I mean, of tiredness <laughs> that okay. we don't have time. But, you know, I, my point would have been here. I'm so sorry we don't have time to develop it, that I don't think there is a necessary contradiction between what the good part of Europe stands for and this, uh, let's call it, emancipation of those excluded by Europe. The first thing I noted is that I try to be very brief, although I could go on for hours. Take the French Revolution. For me, you know which was the crucial moment of the French Revolution? Haiti. Without Haiti, French Revolution would have been a limited European moment. You know what happened in Haiti? People, black people, slaves, rebelled on behalf of European ideals, but they didn't simply imitate European ideas, they gave them a specific twist and it's incredible what in some sense Haitian people not only found their voice, but in finding their voice they were in some sense more European than we were in Europe. The bad guy there, as you probably know, was Napoleon. All my glory to Jacobins who immediately recognized Haiti. Uh, 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 not to send Louverture, he was, I think, uh, already, I don't know why he didn't come to Paris, others. Then Napoleon, as we know, sent the army and a miracle happened there. Do you know what happened? When the French army was approaching Haiti black rebels, they heard some wild singing. And they thought, oh, this must be some stupid black tribal songs. When they came <laughs> nearer, you know what they heard? La Marseillaise. Of course. And all the glory to Polish soldiers mobilized by Napoleon, even with the worst anti-white blacks, they are honored even today. Because they said, wait a minute, we are here on the wrong side. And they changed sight, they went, to the, they went to the blacks. So what I am saying is that another danger that I see. I agree with you deeply. Find blacks, everybody, find your own voice. But do you know that this also can be profoundly manipulated? You know what they shocked me when I was young, I'm old enough, I followed in detail apartheid and the struggle against apartheid and British colonization in India. Do you know that in apartheid, the politics of apartheid, it was of course a lie, but it was also apartheid in the sense, for example, a friend brought me a brochure from apartheid, white South Africa, where they said, we cannot simply introduce equality. All the black tribes will lose their authentic voice and so on. We should keep the difference. And to the end, apartheid people wanted blacks to retain their own culture. Mandela never, that was his greatness, subscribed to this. He was always a universalist. The same in India. Do you know that uh, the British, when they colonized India, they not only they did not try to Europeanize the Indians, they even reprinted, massively propagated. For example, uh, 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 the Lost, the Book of Manu, a traditional Indian book about uh, how authority functions, blah, 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 because they got it that it's much better for colonialism if the natives keep their own culture. Now, you will say, of course, this is not authentic culture, but here is the, the problem, you know, it's not so simple you get your voice. Professor, professor excuse me. 
Please. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. We have, as Africans, we have our philosophy name Ubuntu. I know. I know. Is, you know the Ubuntu uh, philosophy. When we Ubuntu philosophy, you don't talk about democracy. We talk about how we, are, we can be wise and to solve problems. Uh, this is uh, uh, when Europeans come to us, they try to deny our civilization, but they don't succeed. They never succeed. They never succeed. They, they will never succeed because our civilization is stronger, strongest as the European. You have to, to know that in Europe, all the problems you made in this world are coming from Europe. First war, second war. All the wars in the world are so, from sorry, Europe. Sorry. Vous savez comme Français que vous, êtes, que vous avez fait des problèmes partout dans le monde. You, you made problems all in the world. Is that a professor, I don't want to tell you that we have Europe how to learn to, to listen to others. Because I'm European. And that they want to use that you have to answer to solve problems. Sla the problem Slavoj, is Ukraine. I, I you know, suggest, the problem is Ukraine. Suggest, sorry, sorry, okay, I can give back. No, no, I can no, no, let him. Let him. I can be. I can be. I can, be, uh, uh, I can uh, give back uh, uh, the microphone. And I think that uh, I succeed to tell you that I want to say something. And I succeed to tell you that Europe how to learn and uh, talk with others, dialogue with others. Country is very important. Because if you want to solve the problems in the world, in Ukraine, in Mali, in Somalia, we have to sit down and say that something went wrong. Okay, but I think, sorry, Thank you. You, you told it several times, so I think we yeah, understood think, your point. Yeah, okay. we, we do agree. The discussion we had, sorry, the discussion we had earlier is Europe made mistake and we draw lessons. We, 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 we have to listen and we have to go and develop teaching. But I think Europe is doing this work and I'm not sure Everywhere in the world, it is the same thing. So I think now it's time to, to conclude. Do you want to say a, a last word? Okay, Mr. Guy. Yeah, just, ah, okay. Just one word because it was a long discussion yeah. what Europe is bringing or could bring to the world. And there was hypothesis we can bring civilization and we are special and we are developed. I, I think we should play for power of rules not civilizing, because you was mentioning uh, Professor Zizek many times, habits and so on. There is a fantastic book of Norbert Elias, Civilizing Process and mm -hmm. History of Manners. And if you look into this book carefully, you will see how thin is what we are talking about. He describes France, Germany, England, manners until 19th, 20th century and how people behave. So it's much better to play on rules than on civilizing process. Yeah, but what Norbert Elias is saying is we, we need to civilize relationship within nation and this go with the power of rules. So you see, Elias himself is connecting civilization and giving a new meaning of civilization. So the question is what we put behind civilization. So I think we do agree. No, uh, I'm so sorry because you are weak people. I am a, you know how Stalin defined the Bolshevik. We are made of special stuff and so on. I am, I could go on for three hours now. You are weak, ordinary people. But just to say what I wanted to say with these uh, rules. You know, uh, I think, uh, Rules are, uh, my God, uh, again, I try to emphasize this. Rules are never simply rules. They, for example, one example from my own past here. I knew two people in Slovene Central Committee who were young, maybe stupid, because they sincerely believed in our self-management socialism. They lost their job. You know why? Because they sincerely believed in... Uh, self-management. So, so what I'm saying is that, uh, my God, uh, uh, so the only example that I know where they try to impose rules is political correctness. And but, it's but that you, then you get Texas Republican Party, which says I don't accept elections because I don't accept rules. 
No, they are, uh, uh, no, first they are not saying this. What they are saying is Biden broke the rules. And it's much more tragic because they simply have no shared background. Of, they don't speak the same language. But again, I'm so sad we don't have time to prolong that debate about uh, uh, Europe, civilization, and so on, and so on. Uh, I think, I cannot prove it now, I think that in the same way I agree with you that we shouldn't uh, idealize Europe. Europe, nonetheless, remember that people tend to, haha, that would be maybe my schedule against you. You know that in 15th century or later, slavery almost disappeared. And then capitalism, modernity, yes. gave a new impetus to slavery. On the other hand, I'm skeptical just towards all civilizations. I, why, for example, Taliban undoubtedly there, the original, at least part of the original Afghani national voice was expressed. And you get Taliban Af uh, in Afghanistan and so on and so on. So I just think that it, this will be a provocation, you will not agree, that even when we criticize Europe and Eurocentrism, are you aware that most of the logic of the argument is European, is taken from European enlightenment? You will not agree, but because uh, I think that what is nonetheless unique in Europe is that it's a civilization which includes a radical doubt about itself. Like all men are, like Descartes for me is a great figure. Not only was he the first feminist, but he, you know what he says in his meditations? He says, when I was young, I followed my manners and I thought manners of foreigners are stupid. But then I asked myself, what is in the eyes of foreigners? My manners are stupid. That's Europe. And I doubt, I would like to be proven wrong. I doubt if other civilization have such a strong self-doubt included. I'm so sorry we don't have time and you are already in this half hypnotic state so huh. that uh, so, if so. I were to be more a magician, I would tell you, fall asleep, fall asleep, and then each of you put into my pocket 1,000 euros and so on, but so, we cannot so, so, so if I'm right... No, last, you are not, the, but okay, let's okay. go on. Yeah? The, the last word if is, I doubt, hence I'm European. And we conclude. <laughs> I would just add it, I doubt and I'm a European, but included into this is a doubt if I'm really European. I will <laughs> complicate it further. Okay.